From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Ahead for you today, K-State's Glenn Tonzer has this week's cattle market comments. In addition to reviewing last week's price trends, he'll talk about two livestock disease episodes that were in the market news last week and about the pending new trade agreement with Mexico. Also, K-State's Joe Jansen joins us for the first time to take a look at what low-frequency agricultural commodity traders should know about high-frequency commodity futures trading. That's a topic he addressed at the recent Risk and Profit Conference here at K-State. Later, K-State's Charlie Lee covers a new study out of Colorado on wildlife behavior around livestock mortality disposal areas. All this and more next on Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, our Tuesday edition. Thanks for listening in. We'll open up with a look at the cattle markets once more. And across the way now is Glenn Tonzer, livestock economist with K-State Research and Extension. We've an array of things to pick up on as we get going for this week, Glenn, the holiday-shortened week. But first, the cattle markets for last week. You had a mixed bag, one side, the futures to the upside, cash prices opposite of that. Yeah, so there was light trade, which isn't necessarily surprising going into the holiday week. But if we do the cash trade first, the call by USDA was 107 fed cattle. As I said, that was a light volume, about two bucks down for the week. Uh, That is in contrast, as you said, to CME's October contract was at a little over 108, almost 109 actually on Friday. That was up two bucks for the week. So we did have divergence between cash and futures, and you're going to see that on feeders as well. Feeder cattle, cash market was flat to five bucks lower, depending on what market USD was quoting. Closer here to home, the Kansas market was steady to three bucks lower when I look at the calf weights, uh, weight classes that is. Five and a half to 600 pound group out of Salina was about 178. Six to six and a half weight group was 167 for those that want specific examples. Uh, the September feeder cattle contract was just under 150 and again that was up about two bucks for the week there's a lot of gyrations within the week which we'll talk about in a moment when we talk about disease events but to sum up kind of the marketplace specifically and we look at box beef choice was a little under 210 on friday down nearly five bucks for the week and then select was a little over 201 on friday down almost three bucks for the week so both pulled back But I want to give a quick history lesson is for the same period in 2017, so the end of August, choice cutout was actually 191. So we are still 18 bucks above where we were, quote unquote, this time last year. And that can't happen without strong demand. Uh, Demand has been good. I don't apologize for repeating that. Throughout 2018, uh, we have higher supplies, but yet we have prices above where we expected. That only happens with strong demand. Allison Krebs, who's with NCBA, shared some information at the summer business meeting, which is every year out in Denver early in August, and I think it speaks to this, and this is a different measure of demand that actually myself and Ted Schroeder helped NCBA to use, but through June, beef demand was up 20% from where we were in January 2012, and actually May of 2018 was the strongest month during that roughly five and a half year period, and I highlight that, you know, cattle prices throughout the country would not be as high as we are witnessing if we did not have that in this case, domestic demand strength I'm referring to. So I encourage our producers to recognize the hand that's quote-unquote feeding them. And there really seem to be no signals that that demand is going to erode anytime soon, Glenn, or well, are there? Not in the immediate future. I mean, in the let's just talk domestic demand for a moment. Right. Is all the macroeconomic signals are that things are pretty good, uh, GDP growth very strong in the second quarter, wages are growing, unemployment's low, all those kind of things are favorable. 
this is going to sound like a wet blanket, but I will say economists are talking more and more about you know concerns about a recession coming. Now, not next week, but I'll just say in the next you know one to three years is depending on who you listen to. And I only highlight that because in the event we do have a deterioration in macroeconomic conditions here in the U.S., uh, beef demand tends to take a hit. Beef demand is more sensitive to income and expenditure levels in the U.S. than pork and poultry and even non-protein sources of food. So we need to monitor that. To answer your question, in the next few weeks, I'm not concerned. I am a little more concerned that over the next few months, you know, the good times can't go on forever in our general economic environment, and that might show up as a concern on the demand front. You mentioned disease incidents. Well, a couple that made the headlines this past week. There was a case of bovine spongiform encephalopathy, or BSE, identified in Florida, and the interesting part of this is, as the market goes, this barely caused a ripple. Yeah, so this is, I believe, the sixth case of BSC we've had. The first would be the the Calistoke Christmas, December 2003, which all our listeners uh, remember, and we've had a few since then. I am not a disease expert, so I'm not going to break down, you know, how the disease works and so forth. But as I understand it, this is a rare occurrence, but it does occur, and it tends to be in older cows, at least in our industry. So it does happen. You know, the mere fact we found one isn't, quote, unquote, the end of the world. What I think the lesson here is, is the animal was found before it entered the you know, slaughter chain process. So there was no entry into the food supply. So there's no food supply concerns, no you know, human health concerns that are tied to this event. And quite frankly, the market did not react much to the announcement compared in particular to the December 2003 case, which was our first. And I think there's some, you know, wins and lessons that are embedded in that. There was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that followed that 2003 event. We lost the Asian markets. We learned a lot from a pure science perspective of how BSE works and how to monitor for it and how to make changes. But probably just as importantly is how to communicate on these kind of events, how to, you know, be ready. Uh, There's different, you know, industry groups that are often interviewed. Their message was clear and ready to send out. And I think that helps stem the tide against concerns on the food safety front and maybe keeps countries from having, you know, interest in blocking our exports. And those kind of things are very different. So I think sometimes it's important to pause. And even though it was a non-market event in many ways, that in itself is a win. And Mm -hmm. we need to recognize that. And just as a side note, this was an atypical BSC as compared to the one that caused all the ruckus in 2003. So we've learned more about the condition and uh, the industry is communicating accordingly. Exactly. And there's different classes. Is, you know, OIE is a board that sanctions basically our status and so forth. And there's, as I understand it, recognition that these rare events can occur. And that's part of why we have ongoing trade. And that's one of many examples where the scientific knowledge has improved. And I'm all about us improving scientific research-based knowledge. But quite honestly, the core point I think here is, is clear and prudent messaging has probably helped the markets stay calm this past week. Now, the other livestock disease matter at hand, not in this country, but in China, where African swine fever is becoming more concerning with each passing day in that country, it sounds, Glenn. It it is. Now, we're up, as I understand it, the eighth reported case occurred on Labor Day in China. Uh, We've had several over the last two and a half weeks now. And we don't know how many more there's going to be. But for quick context, China is a huge pork producer, a huge pork consumer. You know, there's lots of animals there that are being impacted. The uncertainty is, is how big this event will be. To a certain extent, even globally, will it hit the U.S. and other major pork producing countries is of concern. And there's lots of reasons that we need to be concerned about that that are probably obvious to our listeners. But I'm also going to highlight that we are in a global marketplace, and there's actually a spike in the CME lean hog contract following the first couple announcements because potentially the U.S. benefits from this if there's an adverse event like this that occurs in China and we are fortunate enough to not have that event on the ground here, then all else equal, we might be positioned to benefit if the world wants pork and some of the pork production is being hit. If we have it and others don't, that can help our marketplace. So there's a lot of points in that. One is we are in a global marketplace. You see the markets respond to that. The second part would be we don't really understand how biosecurity investments are made by livestock producers, how effective they are, what public-private incentives we need to help keep diseases like this at bay. And there's more questions and answers in that space. Uh, myself and some colleagues here, we're attempting to answer some of those, but you know, in some sense, we're behind the times on trying to get that research-based knowledge. And if there's one take-home I want to leave everybody with is animal diseases matter. We had the BSE event you know, that was, quote-unquote, a non-market event. But we have decades of lessons around that specific issue, right? So we've learned the market doesn't react quite the same. 
African swine fever is a different piece, and I'm not the disease expert here. It's a different, you know, actually even species we're talking about. But we are in a global marketplace to where when you have an event on one country's, you know, production system, it shows up as an impacting others. And I think it's important for folks to recognize because some wish we weren't in as globalized of a world as we are. But I think this is case in point. We are in a global marketplace when it comes to meat and livestock and many other things. And we need to remember that. Another thing on the table, the negotiations over the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, where by all accounts, the U.S. and Mexico have arrived at a settling point there. And uh, an agreement is apparently about to be finalized. Now, Canada is not yet part of that mix, and that's still the wild card. Yeah, so those discussions are ongoing, and I don't think anything's official until their signatures and all parties, you know, agree to go home and we're done talking about it. I'm in no position to, you know, pretend how close we are to that. What I will highlight is there has been some favorable developments on the discussions with Mexico over the last couple of weeks, specifically to ag. I'm not going to speak about the other components that, you know, everybody can read in the news on auto and those kind of things. But the ag sector here in the U.S. for a long time has basically been asking do no harm, right? You know, on balance, we kind of like the terms of NAFTA as it relates to our relationship with Canada and Mexico. The closer we can stay to having that on balance, that's what ag wanted. And unofficially, it looks kind of like that's what the Mexican-U.S. agreement is going to be. Cross your fingers. Potentially, we'll get that with Canada. And if you want an optimistic point, which it's been a while since I've shared one of these on the trade front, maybe we're getting close to signing, getting whatever the renewed NAFTA is. And if ag comes out of it with similar terms from before, in particular where tariffs aren't they're either zero or low uh, compared to what they were in the pre-NAFTA period, and we don't have lots of extra burdens of doing trade, you know, different production practice claims and those kind of things, then I would consider this a quote-unquote win. Now, even if that happens, there's been lots of uncertainty out of the marketplace that we can't forget about, and, you know, in the future we need to learn from going forward, but we can't undo the past going forward. If ag comes out of this quote-unquote unscathed, that would be a really, really good story. I'm not here promising it, but the last couple of weeks, some of those signs have developed, which is encouraging. Lastly, letting folks know that you will be on the program at the upcoming K-State Beef Stocker Conference that's set for September the 20th, and you'll be sharing thoughts on these and other matters, presumably. Yes, looking forward to it. Uh, Dr. Dale Blasi always pulls together a good program. We will try to speak to whatever the hot topics of the time are. Producers, you can look into the particulars of that event at ksubeef.org. Glenn, as always, thanks for coming over. Thanks for having me on here. Glenn Tonzer is a livestock economist with K-State Research and Extension. Agriculture Today returns in a moment on the K-State Radio Network. Agricultural producers, landowners, and creditors, you have a partner in your legal and financial needs. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services offers reliable, trusted information and guidance. Whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business. To learn more, call 800-321-3276 or visit us online. You're listening to Agriculture Today, and welcome back. And it's always good to introduce to you a new specialist in the agricultural realm here at Kansas State University. And in this case, we welcome in for the first time an agricultural economist who specializes in the dynamics of agricultural commodity markets. Joe Jansen is his name. Joe, a bit about your background and your specialty. You might share that first of all. Yeah, thanks for having me, Eric. You bet. So I... Uh, agricultural economist by training. I grew up on a farm in uh, Manitoba, Canada. Uh, my dad and my brother still farm up there. So that sort of ag is kind of in my in my veins, but left the farm to do a PhD in agricultural economics at the University of California at Davis, and then went and spent five years on faculty at Montana State University. And then just this summer, uh, we took a position here so at, at K-State, and we're really excited to, to be here and join an already great faculty and hopefully kind of make, make a contribution to the ag industry here in the state. Great to have you on board. And again, your focus is on the commodity markets, but not necessarily on the specifics of day-to-day -day price changes, uh, but as on the structure of the markets and the function? Yeah. So, I, I, I mean, we're always sort of – you have to be sort of a, a follower of these markets – 
before you start digging into the details, I do you know follow the markets from day to day, and I do some some outlook kind of stuff where we're thinking about sort of mm-hmm. what's driving prices today and what's sort of the, the supply and demand news that might be affecting prices. Uh, but then I also sort of think about sort of the underlying structure of the market, who's trading, why are they trading, and how does that influence the the prices that we see from day to day. That said, might ask you a very generic question, but one nonetheless that is important. What would you consider the primary issue or issues in the commodity markets these days from the the operational standpoint of those markets? Yeah. So as economists, we sort of think of our central markets, especially the futures and options markets that we have here in the United States as having kind of two major functions. So one, they sort of discover prices. They allow us to sort of gauge what's the value of the commodities that we're producing. Um, and then they also can serve as a risk management tool. So producers people in the industry so that the merchandising firms and users can use those markets to transfer price risk from themselves to other entities. So the benefit of having these markets here in the United States is that we that those risk management tools are really tailored to so they they track prices for example here in the United States more closely than they track prices elsewhere in the world. And so I think as agriculture moves to a sort of more globalized world where we have, you know, major production and consumption in parts around the world. I mean, the wheat market is a perfect example where 30, 40 years ago, the US and and maybe Canada and Australia were sort of the three major players in the world wheat export trade. And now we have a lot of different players. You've had European countries, Russia, uh, Ukraine, and others come into that market. And it's really sort of a multipolar world where prices can be influenced from lots of different places. But the centralized markets where most of the trading occurs is on U.S. futures exchanges. So it's to the benefit of U.S. agribusiness to sort of safeguard the function of those markets, ensure that they're accurately discovering prices, and then giving people throughout the ag value chain uh, an opportunity to transfer risk. So despite the occasional complication that might arise, this is something that agricultural producers in the U.S. should not take for granted. The operational successes of our market system then. Absolutely. Producers often point to fluctuations in prices that they might perceive as sort of unjustified or or strange. But most of the time, our, our markets work really well. And it's important that we sort of ensure that the rules of the game continue to allow them to do that. Right. So that's sort of what I try and do in my research, trying to look at sort of what's changing, how might sort of the, the structure and rules and institutions need to change to, to accommodate sort of a, a, a changing agricultural market. Well, your colleagues in agricultural economics wasted no time in putting you right to work when you arrived here at K-State just a few weeks ago, Joe, in that they enlisted you to make a presentation at the 2018 Risk and Profit Conference here at the university. And the topic that you took on there, we wanted to spend a couple of moments on. Yeah. High-frequency trading in the agricultural futures markets and uh, titled, What Low Frequency Traders Should Know About That. This has been something that has been bandied about lately in terms of the uh, impact of technology and uh, allowing high frequency trading to occur, right? Absolutely. Uh, And something that's sort of, I mean, there's sort of flashpoints where we sort of see incidents that people might blame on high frequency trading, but something that's sort of happened over the last decade or so as electronic trading has become the way that commodity futures contracts are traded uh, in agriculture. And actually, agriculture is a little bit late to that game. Electronic trading came to other markets first. But that's the world that we live in, a world where trading occurs electronically. So this is great because it's allowed sort of new entrants to come in and sort of have more buyers and sellers in, the, in these markets. We think that's, that's great, that more people should mean more accurate prices and, and a better, easier way to trade. But there's sort of a concern that like, what was not sort of possible before, that one, you could program a computer to trade on your behalf and program a computer to react to changes in the market more quickly than any human being could possibly be expected to react. And so we call that high frequency trading. Um, We wonder sort of does that affect prices? Does that make it easier or harder for sort of what I call low frequency traders, sort of anyone who sort of follows these markets, uses them for risk management, but isn't sort of following them at such high frequency that they would need to program a computer to react to market fluctuations. We want to understand sort of well, how prevalent is that and then what effects might it have. And so the, the, the two big takeaways from that are that electronic or algorithmic trading, that's trading by computers without sort of direct human direction, is about 50% of our agricultural markets now. Some of that is sort of speculators and some of that is people active in the physical market using computers to trade on their behalf. 
But it's quite likely that if you, you know, as a producer, you use the futures market to hedge, you put in an order to sell a futures contract, pretty likely about 50% chance that that order will get matched against an electronic algorithmic trader. So producers are trading with these people. And then we sort of wonder, well, what kinds of impacts might that have on price dynamics? And we, we can see some evidence that at very, very high frequency, so with in the matter of, of seconds or microseconds, these traders do kind of have an opportunity to sort of influence price fluctuations. But the magnitude of those impacts is really, really small. So it's quarters of a cent and maybe one or two ticks. So maybe in the wheat futures contract, a quarter cent or half a cent kinds of fluctuations, not big news making price fluctuations that we might think of as sort of having a real impact on the bottom line of producers. So what you're saying there really gets at this concern that has welled up about low frequency traders or those who aren't really deeply engaged in the futures markets, technically speaking, being at a disadvantage to those who are, in fact, so engaged, that disadvantage is minimal, you're saying. That's, from what we can tell, that seems to be the case, that the ability of, say, a high frequency trader to impact prices might be on the order of of a quarter of a cent or half a cent per bushel uh, inside a given trading day, or sort of at the moment that a, a low frequency trader might sort of submit and order to trade a futures contract. That said, we want to sort of continue to do more research and I, and I hope to do more work as I'm here at K-State to sort of continue to monitor our markets and ensure that they're, they're, they're functioning to the benefit of all the participants in the industry. Which leads to the question, are the markets fully sophisticated, technically speaking, or will we see further advances that could accelerate the trading pace even further? Yeah, there is sort of And there's always going to be a race to trade first. And one place that we see that is, say, when the USDA releases reports about supply and demand information around the world. Which was a newsmaker itself recently. Indeed. So in cases like that, there's always going to be sort of a race to trade first. That's not a race that most of the participants in, in the market are going to win. I mean, that's, it's, a, it's really based on sort of the technology that you have available to trade with. And most people in the industry are not going to make the investments that it takes to be sort of the first to react to that information. But at the same time, we want to ensure that, okay, when people are sort of engaging in that race to trade, that it's because it's helping our markets sort of most accurately represent the value of the commodity. And so that race in and of itself isn't bad. And it's always been there. As long as we've had agricultural markets, there's always been a race to trade first. Now that race is really based on on computer technology. Mm -hmm. So you've seen things like the USDA trying to make their reports be released in as fair a manner as possible so that no one participant in the market has sort of an advantage over others in how they get that information and then are able to trade on the basis of it. Mm -hmm. Which led to the change in the lockup procedure at the USDA. That's right. So the USDA said that there was the potential for their information to get released by some of the people, some of the organizations that participate in the lockup up more quickly than they could release it themselves. And so they actually ended the lockup. That was a a pretty strong way of dealing with the issue. But there's a sound rationale for it. And that was that we want to be fair to all market participants. And that that should sort of, I think, is an underlying principle that not necessarily that we make everyone happy, but as long as we're sort of treating everyone with equity and fairness, that's a good guiding principle for how we sort of set the rules of the game. It's still about price discovery, the route to that may change over time, but the objective is still in place, right? That's right. And yeah, that goal has to be sort of first and foremost as we sort of create the rules of of trading in our agriculture markets is, are these prices representing the value of the commodity? Are they sending the right signal to people in the industry about, should I sell or store? The decisions that that producers uh, and agribusinesses are dealing with every day. Joe, it's always a stimulating topic, the functions of our markets, and uh, we will undoubtedly have you back in the future here to uh, talk more about your work in this area, and it's really good to have you here at K-State in investigating these questions. Appreciate your time, and we'll get together again soon. Thank you very much, Eric. He's Joe Jansen, newly appointed agricultural economist here at Kansas State University. He's been our guest on this part of Agriculture Today. We'll return after this break. You're listening to the K-State Radio Network. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. 
This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Welcome back to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Well, we were away yesterday for the Labor Day holiday, so we have a bit of catching up to do. In regard to the weekly feature from the Kansas Forest Service here at K-State, normally presented on a Monday, but we'll share it with you right here, this week's edition of Tree Tales. Awaiting with that, K-State Forester, Bob Atchison. Bob? As a forester in Kansas, I am often asked whether fall or spring is the best time to plant trees. My patent answer is, it depends on the weather. Historically, we get most of our moisture in May and June, and most nurseries are geared towards spring tree planting. However, people interested in establishing trees in the fall should consider planting nuts by collecting local seed. Most trees in Kansas drop their seed in the fall, which may begin in late August through November. Seed collection should occur as soon as possible after seeds drop, and the sooner the nuts are planted, the better. Black walnut is one of the easiest trees to establish with seed. The husk should be left on to keep the nuts moist to prevent loss of viability. The nuts can be stored in small piles less than 10 inches deep to keep them from heating up. You'll also want to protect them from squirrels, who are among the best tree planters in our state. Oak acorns should be collected in breathable bags, such as onion sacks or burlap bags. Immediately after collection, seeds should be soaked in water for 12 to 24 hours, drained and stored in cool, dark places until planting. Seed can also be purchased, but remember, seed must be planted in the fall so it may experience what we call the natural stratification process that enables germination to occur. Seed should be planted one to three inches deep in soil that has been well cultivated and free of weeds and grass. Seed can be planted by hand or broadcast with a scoop shovel from the back of a pickup truck or trailer. Forced contractors will often use a fertilizer spreader on larger direct seedings. If you're planting less than an acre that's surrounded by trees, predation of the nuts will most certainly be an issue. A number two tomato or peach can with the bottom removed with an X cut in the top of the lid can be placed over planted nuts for protection. When it comes to establishing trees using seeds and nuts, most people ask foresters for detailed information on how to properly collect and store seed over the winter for spring planting. But why not allow nature to do the work? Planting nuts in the fall will avoid all that extra work associated with artificial stratification of seed. This is Bob Atchison with the Kansas Forest Service. You've been listening to another Tree Tale. Thanks, Bob. And our normal Tuesday fair now for you dairy producers from the Animal Sciences and Industry Department at K-State. Milk Lines... Awaiting with that, as always, K-State Dairy Specialist, Mike Brook. Mike? Today I'd like to visit with our Kansas dairy farmers concerning some options for emergency forage. As we're coming out of a very dry summer in many areas of the state, there's going to be some needs for some additional forage production. And with the recent rains we've received, opportunity that we have to take advantage of that moisture and maybe raise some forages for our dairy animals and possibly other ruminants around the state as well. So, some things to consider. Many of the acres where we took off corn silage are now open to be seeded to something else. And in many cases, there's probably significant fertilizer left in the field because the corn crop did not utilize everything that we put down. So, we have opportunity from that standpoint as well. So some of the things that we might consider would be some of our cover crops that we generally use during the fall and winter season. Triticale is probably one of the most popular when we look at forage quality, generally a little higher in forage quality than rye, although some producers may choose to seed rye. In some cases, we might include a legume with that, 
some clover, sometimes crimson clover, is used as a mixture with that triticale. That will increase the protein content. There's some other things that you might also consider in some instances, things like turnips and radishes could also be raised for a grazing crop. One of the issues with these crops is in the springtime, these crops will rot in the field. They do produce quite a bit of odor, so if you're next to uh, population or next to houses, you might want to consider that. It's a short-lived issue, but it will cause some issues with some of your neighbors. Now, as you take a look at cover crops and potential to raise some cover crops, you might want to consider the herbicides that you use during your corn crop or other summer crop. Again, make sure that those herbicides do not interfere with the growth of some of the cover crops. Some of our cover crops, such as triticale, are impacted by some of the herbicides that we use on corn. Even though it's been several months since we applied those, depending on the rate and which chemicals we chose, may reduce the growth of the cover crop. How are you going to use this cover crop then in your production system? Well, there's a couple of options. Obviously, we could graze that this fall, and that may provide pasture for 60 to maybe 90 days. And depending on how open the winter is, could even be longer than that. You could also graze again in the spring and then burn it down and seed your normal summer crop. Or you could choose to harvest the crop in the spring as a forage crop. Probably if we're trying to get corn into the ground, following that we probably want to harvest that as a silage crop so we get it off the field quicker. If we're willing to wait a little bit later, maybe going to turn those acres into soybeans for the next crop, we might be able to harvest that as hay. Just keep in mind that in springtime we generally have weather conditions that make it very, very difficult to actually dry these crops to a point to which we can actually bale hay without getting a lot of mold. That is the reason why harvesting as a silage crop may be the best advantage for a spring harvest of these types of crops. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension, encouraging our dairy farmers that we do have some options when it comes to emergency forages, and with the recent rains, we have the opportunity. All right, Mike, many thanks. Quick reminder ahead of the break that the 2018 Kansas Performance Tests with Winter Wheat Varieties report is now online. You can see the results of the 2018 Wheat Variety Performance Test trials around the state. Producers, crop consultants use this resource to help select winter wheat varieties for planting this fall. You can access that very easily, agronomy.kstate.edu, and look under Crop Performance Tests. That's agronomy.k-state.edu. K-State's Charlie Lee is in next for his weekly visit here on Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State Research and Extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. We're back now on Agriculture Today, and Charlie Lee joining us, wildlife specialist with K-State Research and Extension. Here's an out-of-the-ordinary study out of our neighboring state, Colorado, Charlie, and it uh, got into a subject that you are surprised has not been really researched before, the activity of wildlife around livestock mortality pits. Yes, we've got a lot of information on humans manipulating wildlife habitat. Oftentimes we've thought of that habitat as being primarily vegetation enhancements or new plantings to try to attract wildlife to an area. We've also used feeders. But one area that has not been explored has been what wildlife use the carcasses around concentrated animal feeding operations where those carcasses are disposed of into a mortality pit or dead pile. There's lots of different names of those types of locations. 
where carcasses are put in a pile. Sometimes they're buried, sometimes they're composted, but oftentimes they just seem to be left there to decay on their own. And this is a common order of business at large feeding operations and elsewise where mortalities are simply part of the reality. Yeah, the carcasses are deposited there for a variety of reasons. You know, they may be euthanized because of health reasons. They may have died of uh, of a known or unknown health problem. And they could be domestic or animals. They could be wildlife from roadkill operations. So this particular study was set out with two objectives. One was to identify the animals that visited mortality pits and the second was to determine the rates of visitation of those common wildlife species. So this was done in Colorado up in uh, the Fort Collins area, uh, done on four different sites. Three of those locations, the main species that were deposited in those mortality pits were fish or fish eggs. The other site was roadkill that were picked up from surrounding roads and highways. They placed two motion cameras at each one of those sites. One of the cameras was a infrared activated camera that took an image when anything uh, impacted the beam. One image was taken, 10 seconds later a second image was taken. The other camera at that same pit was set on a time delay where it took an image once every five minutes. And then basically they just listed the animals that were observed and then the length of time that they were at the site and if they could identify those animals as a specific individual was also noted. And as it turned out, that list was quite extensive, as a matter of fact. Yes, they observed 43 different species that visited the mortality pits uh, during a total of over 1,100 total camera trap days. And It was quite surprising the number and different species that were observed utilizing those mortality pits. Coyotes were seen at all four sites, but were only observed at those sites at night and in the very early morning. Uh, Raccoons, coyotes, domestic dogs, deer, bald eagles, uh, magpies and crows, Great blue herons, house sparrows were the most numerous animals that were observed at the sites. At one site, one individual coyote visited the site 39 out of 141 trap days. So he was a fairly frequent visitor Hmm. and actually averaged 17 separate visits to those sites each day. There were similar visitation rates at some of the other sites. Uh, Raccoons were periodically observed at night, but were often seen in family groups, uh, and they would occupy the site for a considerable length of time. It was also surprising at the number of other ungulates or large hooved animals that utilize the roadkill deposition site. Mule deer visit the sites either individually or in small groups. Although mule deer were not observed consuming any parts of the carcasses, Uh, They would often feed on the vegetation that was around the carcasses and would inspect the carcasses. Inspecting carcasses was very pronounced when a fresh deer or elk from a roadkill was added to the mortality pit. So you had a mix of species. Some are scavenging, some are not. One of the worries from this, though, you say, is the potential that these species that are frequenting these areas could be spreading disease. Sure, and, and one of the, the species or groups of species that were there were visiting the pits were birds. When we looked at how far birds can travel, uh, they can certainly spread some of those pathogens fairly easily. Avian influenza could certainly be spread by birds uh, from contact with infected feces. Uh, it can be with resources that are contaminated by those feces. The mammals' carcasses could also uh, be a cause for pathogens such as plague or tularemia. All of those are significant issues, and we need to take some steps to try to reduce the likelihood of those pathogens being spread. 
what this comes down to then as far as recommendation, you say, is that whatever means possible limiting access to these mortality pits might be in order. I think that certainly we should be able to do some things to keep domestic animals away from those pits. Uh, If we're trying to reduce the risk to wildlife, that's going to be a little bit more challenging. But we seem to just be largely ignoring some of the risks that are out there. And it's, it's not just the pathogens that wildlife might spread to humans or other wildlife or even domestic animals. It's also the risk of ingestion of drugs uh, that may have been used to treat some of the animals that are uh, in the mortality pits. Or in some cases, it could be lead exposure from animals that were euthanized or picked up as hunters uh, were not able to recover a carcass. So there's, there's lots of risk when animals are feeding on other animals in these mortality pits. And I think it really behooves us to try to do a better job at reducing that contact with other wildlife around mortality pits. Well, this study raises several important considerations on how those mortality management areas are handled and uh, how wildlife might interact with those. A study out of Colorado conducted by the USDA recently. Charlie, thanks for giving us the overview of this. Wildlife Specialist Charlie Lee of K-State Research and Extension. Well, that's our time for today. As always, we appreciate you tuning in and welcome you right back here this same time tomorrow. Eric Atkinson here. This has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.